Hi, good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, uh, welcome to my talk about machine learning at MyTaxi. Um, actually, where is my presentation slides? Yeah, good. Welcome to my talk about machine learning at MyTaxi. Um, I'm working at MyTaxi since three years as a data engineer, so I'm not really the expert on machine learning, but I think I'm getting or becoming an expert uh, since half a year or more, um, because I had the luck to be part of the project for the first uh, machine learning project at MyTaxi, um, which is the fare calculator uh, for taxi tours. And before talking about the fare calculation, I briefly want to um, give you an introduction about my um, MyTaxi in general as a company. and. Um, then talk about the data infrastructure, which enables uh, data products um, at MyTaxi, and then finally talk about the machine learning part. So to start with, um, MyTaxi was founded in 2009 in Hamburg. Um, the headquarters is still in Hamburg, but we grew a lot, so we are active now in 13 countries and over 50 cities, which meant, uh, or which led to a second developer hub in Barcelona to keep up the pace to um, continuously growth and uh, deliver new features. And right now we're starting a data science hub here in Berlin, so if you're interested to hear about that, um, just talk to me, write me, whatever, um, contact me. Uh, we are looking for data scientists, um, data engineers, everything with data. Yeah, um, so what we're doing in the data engineering part, um, our core product, the MyTaxi app, uh, consists of two um, apps actually. One on the one hand, you have the driver side, on the other hand, you have the passenger side. So, and in the back end, it's all about, or it's a microservice uh, architecture. So, we got several sources, around 100, could be more, could be less, I think it's more. But um, mostly databases, um, endpoints, um, like you can call it by arrest and get some JSONs, or you have some queues we're connecting to. Um, to get the data into the DWH or data warehouse. Um, to do so, we implemented around, at the moment, I think it's also more than 200, it could be even 300 uh, daily tasks, just processing the data from, from the app to the DWH um, to get a unified model which everyone can access then. Um, basically, we have uh, three steps or three layers in our um, Data engineering, <coughs> data engineering side. Sorry, <coughs> I got a cold yesterday, so I'm <laughs> a bit itchy in my th um, throat. <coughs> sorry. So, uh, so that over. So we got uh, three layers um, in our data infrastructure. The first one is uh, the import part, just importing raw data from the apps and some external sources, like getting downloads from the Play Store or from the iTunes Store to our Hadoop cluster, which is basically HDFS, but also some S3 buckets, uh, depends on the data we are talking about or how we use it or where we are importing it from. Um, yeah, to do so, we are using Scoop. Scoop is quite good for batch importing data from rela relational databases to um, HDFS, or for streaming data, we're using Kafka, um, yeah, to get the data into the um, in a raw format uh, into the Hadoop cluster. Raw means in this case that we got plenty of test cases, uh, we got wrong data, we got old data structures, um, we are importing basically everything. So with these 200 daily processing tasks, um, we're actually first cleaning the data, uh, transforming the data, and then um, yeah, adding some logic so that we have a good data model which everyone can use it and then on the third layer uh, can access. Our processing tasks are mainly implemented in Python uh, and managed in Airflow. I'm not quite sure if you heard of Airflow. Airflow was initially developed by Airbnb, a really cool product It's open sourced and had a huge community, so it got, um, um, so now it's available under Apache license because um, more and more companies are using it and it's great to manage workflows, um, setting up data pipelines and handling all the dependencies between the tasks we have to do. For example, we got task A for importing the data, then we got task B 
doing some cleaning, uh, removing test tours, and task C is waiting for test B and test A to finish, so we can set up all the dependencies and um, manage the data pipelines. Yeah, the third layer is all about accessing the data. On the one hand, um, my colleagues want to look at the data. Um, some just while, while drinking coffee, uh, taking a look into the Tableau dashboard, uh, just wanting to check out the latest numbers from yesterday, how many tours we had, and stuff like that. Um, if we're talking about the analysts, they want to do some more things like uh, ad hoc queries, which means they can use Redash. Redash is also an open source tool um, you can easily provide and um, give access to everyone in the company um, to access your database and doing some ad hoc queries. And also providing queries like safe queries and give it to your colleague if you want to. Um, on the other hand, um, you can also use uh, all kind of um, querying tools uh, if you want to. But the m biggest improvement we had so far in the last half year or longer since we are setting up this data infrastructure was actually when we introduced Presto. Presto is developed by Facebook. It's not really released right now, but um, there's a, I would say, stable beta out there in version 0.18 or something. So it's really just at the beginning, but it's um, extremely fast, uh, works in memory. Presto is like Hive, uh, you can, it <laughs> is like Hive, but uh, a lot faster, so it just works in memory and Hive swaps sometimes to uh, hard disk, so it's um, not that fast. Um, and as the other user I mentioned is the automated access, so we got some services in the app which are um, yeah, collecting data from our DWH and feeding it back to the um, app. And now um, there begins the machine learning part, which is also dependent on our um, DWH. So I have to say, to really implement data products, you have to get first your data infrastructure um, well set up, uh, that means also data quality, that you know where can something go wrong because errors will occur, and that you deliver a certain amount of quality. So if there's an error, you should know about it. Good, that's, to, that's so far the part from the backend side. Um, getting now to uh, the machine learning part, and I want to do a short recap, although I think I saw it once or twice today, um, how do we approach machine learning problems in general? We first have to study the problem, really have to know um, what this is all about, um, what is an input, what's, what is the desired output? Do we need some regression, like for the fair prediction, we want to have a continuous value, or do we need um, classification or something else? So first study the problem, and with study the problem, I don't only mean like looking at the data and seeing what data is available, but also talk to people. Because you really have to um, know the domain um, where you're working in, and because otherwise you will uh, miss data, or you will, um, yeah, your feed tendering part will be um, harder to do. So after studying all the domain and you know what you uh, want to have as uh, an output, you can choose an algorithm and then apply an initial data set and then the scientific part starts like iterations, 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 modifying the data set um, until you are satisfied and then you can launch a product. For the fair estimation, um, it worked a bit different for us. Actually, when we implemented the first fair calculation, it wasn't that hard because German legislation um, made it pretty easy for us. Uh, German legislation, I'm not quite sure if you're familiar with it, but taxi rides in Germany are um, dependent on the city level or, um, yeah. And you got a pretty easy rule set, like you have a base price and a price per kilometer and then some additional fees, like I think in Berlin it's, for example, mobile payment fee, fee which sometimes is referred to as the my taxi fee, um, but it's, it is for mobile payment, but I think we are, we, we just have been the first one who implemented mobile payment, so it's in my text fee. 
Um, so we started off with the fare calculation. It was working well. Um, then we launched new cities and we saw that it's hard to maintain all this information for all the cities um, because the rules are easy, but um, it gets a lot. After a while, we had around 20 cities, 25 cities, and only and working two or three people who were making sure that these rules are up to date and that we don't miss out anything. Then we started to launch a new city, uh, new countries, which have a complete different um, price model uh, from Germany. So we had new features. Uh, we had unknown factors uh, influencing the price estimation, or the price in general. So we identified a few tours which were pretty similar in starting time and distance, like it looks almost the same, but they differ at least sometimes here it's 25%, but sometimes more. Um, so we had to do something about that. Um, we first studied the problem. I mean, we knew a lot about fair estimation, but then we built an initial data set and just choose an algorithm, um, which means, sorry, I have really dry mouth. <coughs> Yeah, we chose an algorithm, and uh, it doesn't really matter which one you take. Um, if you have enough data, just take an algorithm and start. Uh, we chose decision trees or the random forest approach and the support vector machines, which worked quite well out of the box. Uh, I mean, the first results weren't that good, but um, both algorithms are performed quite similarly. And with increasing the data set, it, it um, it's even more similar. So if you have a small data set, it could differ a bit, but um, using more and more data, uh, the algorithms perform quite similar. So for us, it was at first also uh, not really a question of uh, taking which algorithm, but also what should we do with the algorithm. There are plenty of parameters. For example, for the support vector machines, you have different kernels. Um, yeah, and you can test it, but this testing is all um, or could all be automated. So if you want to start machine learning, just choose the algorithm, don't care about the uh, parameters and automate everything, at least the optimization. Um, so we figured out that the feature engineering is way more important and I think uh, this is also what Sebastian told us uh, or like all the other speakers. Feature, feature engineering is way more important than um, working with the algorithm. This is at least true for big data sets. If you have small data sets, um, you should be aware that the algorithm should be chosen wisely, and also the parameters are quite important, but for big data sets, it's not that big a deal. So we started feature engineering, and we had some certain data. We had, for example, um, we know when a passenger wants to order the taxi, and we know the pickup location, we know the destination. And so we could say, let's model the weekdays, let's model the weekends, um, do a day and night split, and all this kind of stuff. And we're pretty certain about it because we know the timestamp. Then we got into a little bit of trouble um, doing more and more feature engineering on the timestamp. For example, we tried to model the rush hour. It worked quite well, but we weren't really certain about why it worked so well because we can't really model the rush hour. Rush hour is not just a timely constraint, but also a geographical um, feature. So we have uncertain data. This was the first time where we said, yeah, okay, we should um, not only look at the data, but also what data is available when we are doing the estimation and what data is really reliable. Uh, to be honest, we are using a lot of uncertain data, for example, the route distance, but, and it works pretty well, but you should be aware of that. Um, you can handle uncertainty, but you should be aware of that. Route distance um, is one of the examples which is not quite obvious why it's uncertain, because it works in 90%, 95% of all times quite well. For, for the route distance, we ask Google to estimate the distance for us, it doesn't really matter if it's timely-wise the shortest or distance-wise the shortest um, route, but um, Google delivers the route. There are places in Rome, I think, was the first case where we saw that, uh, where in the inner city part, um, 
inner city zones where taxis are allowed to drive, but regular cars aren't. So we saw that, and obviously then the route distance delivered by Google is uh, wrong. Could be that the taxi driver is just going for two kilometers, and the um, initially route we expected, or the distance we expected, is about five kilometers. Yeah, this is a real problem. So you should be aware of what is uncertain data and what is certain data. Um, also for the driver distance to passenger, which is a big influence in Italy. Um, and then it gets interesting to take even more uh, uncertain data into account. Um, for example, metadata for, um, from the driver. Uh, we used to rate the driver somehow internally and then use obviously the rating by the passengers and the relationship to the passengers, uh, which is all just a research, it's not really live, but um, this metadata is quite interesting. The impact is not that big, but especially for not so um, strictly regulated markets, um, quite interesting because you can really optimize your outcome, your correct predicted tours. Um, yeah, so feature engineering is one of the biggest part and you have to do it um, a lot and you have to actually do it all the time. So to sum things up, um, first of all, if you want to start machine learning, just choose uh, some algorithm. I would say you can always choose a decision tree. It doesn't really matter what you want to do. Just start with it or support vector machines. Um, and then just begin with it. Uh, it worked quite well for us, not only for the fair prediction, but also for other um, problems we had. Uh, demand prediction, for example, um, we want to predict where the passengers are and what kind of demand the driver expects or what kind of demand we expect at a certain time in a certain place. And the big advantage from decision trees is that the decision making is understandable. You can see exactly why this decision was made. So that means um, not only that you make a good estimation, but also you can um, talk to the other um, departments and say, we saw that in Italy, feature X and Y is quite important. Um, and you could use that to actually improve the driver experience. So our driver service can talk to the driver and say, hey, we have this information. You should probably start your shift at 8 o'clock because the demand is quite high then. Um, on the other hand, if you want to get the data product live, um, you should consider what kind of learning method do you want to have. So for the fair estimation, it's totally sufficient to do offline learning. Offline learning means um, you learn if necessary, you don't really learn on the fly, which means you can't really adapt to changes, not that quickly at least. Um, for that, we are doing a daily ev uh, evaluation. Uh, if the model is still good enough, if it is, we do nothing. If it's not, we should um, learn again. And then another thing, uh, which is also quite important for feature engineering, um, we choose a lot the divide and conquer approach, which is kind of common in computer science, but we split it from the beginning on. We said uh, we look at each city, which is a bit more effort at the beginning, but afterwards we can easily add new cities without retraining a model which is considering all, or which is valid for all the cities. So really to sum things up in general, I would say uh, first develop a solid infrastructure if you have the power, but if you just want to do some predictive analysis or some machine learning, you can also start uh, with that without having a solid infrastructure, but then do a proper feature engineering and just choose a random algorithm, I would say, um, and that's from my side. So thank you. If you have any questions, um, just contact me, write me. If you want to know something about our new data science hub here in Berlin, just ask me and um, I'll be around somewhere here. Thank you.